for giving me the giving me the opportunity to present. It's an honor to kick off, kick off the second season of this province-wide initiative, and I'm eager to see how it continues to grow and evolve in the upcoming years. Again, I have to acknowledge the efforts and dedication of both Raphael and Fabio, who really deserve an incredible amount of recognition for bringing us together and organizing these rounds. Feedback we've received so far has been very encouraging, and we would love to continue to expand. So please email Raphael or Fabio with any suggestions regarding format or potential topics, or if you know of any other centers that would like to be included. Uh, we're going through the accreditation process at present and hopefully we'll, we'll be CPD eligible by November of this year. Uh, so then at least you'll get some credits for being able for attending as well. So I have no disclosures or competing interests. And the uh, focus of today's lecture will be on errors made during transesophageal echocardiography. Uh, Fabio, Raphael, and I will each present two cases in which we made errors during our role as echocardiographers. Uh, when I speak to many of our fellows, and they all share a common anxiety regarding the pressures of having to read and interpret critical echoes independently on call during their first years of practice. And I can confidently assure you uh, that you will all inevitably make mistakes in the acquisition, interpretation, or application of your TE images. I would love to be able to tell you that the error is lessened as time goes on, but I think that experience has shown me now that I don't make fewer errors, I just make different ones. But the key is to analyze and reflect on those errors and to learn from them and be open to modifying your practice with critical self-appraisal and commitment to lifelong learning. So without further ado, let's get into the first case. So for our first case, you're called to perform an emergency TEE for a type E dissection who has become hemodynamically unstable during a TVAR. The patient is a 76-year-old male with no known cardiac history. He presented to the ED after experiencing one day of left-sided scapular pain, which progressed to band-like chest pain. In the emergency department, he reported intermittent motor changes in the left lower leg with no sensory changes. Examination revealed an absence of a palpable pulse on the left lower extremity. He was H, uh, sorry, he was hemodynamically stable, uh, but reported intermittent abdominal pain concerning, uh, concerning for malperfusion. A stat CTA showed an aortic dissection involving the aortic arch and descending thoracic aorta extending to the abdomen. The dissection started in the aortic arch just beyond the left carotid artery takeoff and does involve the proximal left subclavian artery. An interval defect is seen proximately, and the false lumen has a large amount of thrombus with narrowing of the true lumen. Note that what is not captured in the CTA is the arch. Uh, he was booked for emergency TVAR and you're called shortly after induction before the endovascular stent is deployed. So your first images of TE show grossly normal biventricular function with an estimated LVEF of 55 to 60%. The transgastric short axis view shows hypokinesis of the inferior wall but no other regional wall motion abnormalities. So transesophageal long axis views show thickened aortic valve leaflets, but no significant AI. The non-coronary cusp appears most calcified, but all the aortic valves appear to be opening, or sorry, all the aortic valve cusps appear to be opening freely. The ascending aorta does not show any evidence of a retrograde dissection, and the sinuses and the coronary arteries appear intact. Uh, deep transgastric view is performed to assess gradients through the aortic valve. And Doppler interrogation yields the following measurements. So a max aortic velocity of 1.59 meters per second, a max gradient of 10, a mean gradient of 5, but an AVA or aortic valve area by continuity equation of 0 0.93, which is concerning for severe aortic stenosis or critical aortic stenosis, I should say, and dimensionless or Doppler velocity index of 0.24, which also suggests critical aortic stenosis. Views of the descending thoracic aorta shows a thrombus of the false lumen and a small compressed true lumen. Uh, the intimal tear was identified in the arch just proximal to the left subclavian artery, as was identified also on the CTA. 
So this brings us to our first poll. And thank you to Raphael for helping set up the polling system and the interactivity. Uh, so in the study, one or more errors was made in image interpretation. So please select as many options as you think apply. In which part of the study do you think a misinterpretation occurred? I'll give you the next 30 seconds to lock in your decision. Great, so we have uh, a kind of a mixed bag, but the majority of people think that uh, air was uh, made interpreting the aortic valve. And I agree with that. So in terms of the specific air, uh, the aortic valve is where the misinterpretation occurred, but what was the air that was made when interpreting the aortic valve gradient? And your options are incomplete AS trace, incomplete LVOT trace, inaccurate LVOT sample envelope, or a miscalculation. And here's the images again that you can see to make your decision. If we can put up the second poll, Raphael. And again, this is multiple choice. You can select as many as you think apply. So inaccurate LVOT sample envelope is the most popular choice, and that is the correct one. So the error made here is the placement of the pulse wave Doppler sampling envelope during measurement of the LVOT velocity. The first indication that this is the case is the extremely low velocity through the LVOT, which should be closer to 0.8 to 1 meter per second in a patient with a normal left ventricle, or at least a normal ejection fraction. Here we see that the velocity or the max velocity through the LVOT is closer to like 0.4 meters per second. The effect of an improperly placed sampling envelope is highlighted in this diagram by the British Society of Echo Guidelines on the echocardiographic assessment of aortic stenosis from 2021. Flow acceleration occurs as the blood enters the narrow LVOT. The further away from the LVOT that the envelope is placed, the slower your velocities will be, and the greater the difference relative to the aortic valve velocity. This in turn causes an overestimation of the degree of stenosis or an underestimation of the aortic valve area when calculated by the continuity equation. Although one of the benefits of using the Doppler velocity or the dimensionless index is a non-reliance on the accuracy of your LVOT measurement, as we see in this case, it is still susceptible to error if the pulse wave sample envelope is misplaced. So here, this just highlights the distance. Sorry, my error doesn't show up on, on the presenting screen. But as you can see on the left side of the screen, that the, the PW sample envelope is quite far away from the aortic valve. To avoid this error, the guidelines recommend placing the pulse wave Doppler sample envelope initially right on the aortic valve, which usually results in aliasing as seen in slides A and B here. The envelope should then be slowly moved apically. And as you move away from the valve, you'll see a trace with a wide area of density at the apex, which represents blood flow through the zone of acceleration immediately proximal to the valve. Sampling here will cause an underestimated degree of stenosis. You don't want to sample here yet. But as you continue to move away, the wide area of density resolves and the PW trace takes on its normal empty appearance. And the earliest appearance of this characteristic trace is the correct site for sampling. As we see from our study, the pulse wave trace is full and low velocity suggesting the sample envelope is outside of the LDOT, which drastically reduces the measured velocity. The patient was stabilized with general measures such as volume, transfusion, and pressors, 
And this erroneous finding was reported to the vascular surgery team who did their due diligence in order to follow up echo postoperatively. As we have already deduced, the finding of AS was a misinterpretation and the valve was normal on repeat interrogation with low gradients and a, a normal valve area, or at least only moderately reduced valve area. Okay, so that's the first case, on to the second. And we're gonna be talking about mitral valve repair. So case two involves a 62 year old female with severe symptomatic mitral regurgitation and atrial fibrillation. She has a history of a long-standing murmur and has progressive fatigue and shortness of breath on exertion for the last year. Uh, she's noticed that she has now difficulties with activities of daily living. Uh, her echo showed thickened mitral valve leaflets, eccentric MR due to severe P2 prolapse and flail, dilated LV with normal biventricular function, moderate TR, no flow limiting coronary artery disease. And a past medical history, which is significant for BMI of 42, she stands 5'3 and 250 pounds, uh, atrial fibrillation on Xarelto, and she's had a jaw injury after a motor vehicle accident in the past. So initial images show a dilated LV with preserved function, as well as a grossly dilated LA, which explains the associated atrial fibrillation. There are no regional wall motion abnormalities seen in the transgastric short axis view. An examination of the mitral leaflets show thickened anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets characteristic of myxomatous disease. There is clear flail of the P2 leaflet seen with an eccentric anteriorly directed jet of severe MR. Here's the same valve in the bicomitral view with and without color. In the 90 degrees. and 3D images, which show the expected P2 flail. And this was reported as the mechanism for the MR to the surgeon. Whenever we're doing mitral valve repair, we always look for both predictors of SAM and predictors of post mitral valve or persistent mitral valve regurgitation after the repair. So these static measurements include an anterior leaflet length of 3.44 centimeters, an aorta mitral angle of 120 degrees and a C-CEP distance of 36 millimeters. So she, this patient was deemed relatively low risk for SAM post repair and the surgeons chose an angioplasty ring using a physio sizer, meaning that they didn't upgrade or downgrade the size of the mitral ring. So poll number three is what feature of the mitral valve was missed during the assessment? And the options are AML tethering, a2 prolapse, P1 prolapse, a P2 cleft, P3 prolapse, or mitral stenosis. And while the poll goes up, I will show you uh, the images in a little bit bigger. So a little bit of a mixed bag here. So nothing clear. And I think that that represents uh, well, actually, or, or kind of goes along with the ambiguity that was involved in this case, right? Okay. So having identified the prolapsing P2 as the likely culprit, we proceeded with a straightforward PML repair. Three, neo, three neocords um, were placed in each of the anterolateral and posterior medial papillary muscles and attached directly to the posterior mitral valve leaflet. All the neocords were attached specifically to the prolapsing P2 segment. There was a size 36 millimeter physio ring and there was good coaptation on water test. They also performed the tricuspid valve repair, left and right atrial maze and a left atrial appendage exclusion. So we discontinued bypass and we met with the following images. There's at least mild MR with a vena contracta that measured anywhere between three and five millimeters on serial measurements. And although we considered accepting this result, the surgeons were not happy and returned to bypass to re-arrest the heart 
before a complete inspection of the valve could be performed. As we arrested, the surgeons asked specific questions about the native valve morphology, including there were, whether there were any prolapse of the A2 or P3 segments. We examined the valve closely and felt that there could potentially be billowing of the, above the annular plane, but no evidence of frank prolapse. However, we could not rule out a small cleft between P1 and P2. The surgeons repaired the cleft, which was easily identified on closer inspection. So we felt that we identified the culprit and then repeat TE showed the following. Clearly things had gotten worse and we hadn't fixed the problem. So now we did what we should have done the first time and spent a considerable amount of time inspecting the valve while kicking ourselves for going back on in the first place. And here I'll take you through the various views, mitral valve at zero and 60, which you can see the clear uh, regurgitated jet. You couldn't really appreciate it uh, very much at 90 or 120 degrees. And then at around 150 degrees, what became obvious was a large coaptation gap that was the source of the worsening mitral regurgitation. So this was actually like a defect where the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets weren't meeting. And this was likely because of this severity of the restriction of the posterior mitral valve leaflet. 3D imaging does not add much in this case, although the color 3D does show the source of the jet originating from the tip of the posterior mitral valve leaflet, which goes along with what we think so far. But complicating this case is that after two prolonged pump runs, the RV has become dilated and showing signs of significant dysfunction. The surgeons themselves disagreed between themselves or amongst themselves about the best next possible step, with one advocating for replacement and the other feeling that repair was still possible. So they turned to you for the tie-breaking vote. And at this stage, what would you recommend the surgeon do to address the residual MR? Would you downsize the ring appreciating that the patient was at low risk for SAM. Would you release neocords to the anterior leaflet? Would you release neocords to the posterior leaflet? Or would you just elect for valve replacement at this stage? And I'll put this up so you can take a look while you decide. So the top two answers here are release neocores to posterior leaflet and valve replacement. And I think that's probably what the main thing that we were deciding between in this case in particular. So we felt that the coaptation gap likely resulted as discussed already from an overly restricted posterior valve leaflet. There were no neocores to the anterior leaflet, so that was a red herring of an answer. And the idea here, or what the surgeons plan to do, was release two of the six neocords, which isn't a major intervention. So we were a little bit of two minds as to whether or not this was going to work. And we were putting the patient at significant risk, likely if it wasn't going to work, only because now we were probably about six or seven hours into surgery. So the idea by releasing the neocords is you release some of the restriction of the posterior leaflet in order to increase the coaptation and close the gap. This was ultimately successful, and the MR was reduced to trace and the outcome was accepted and we left the OR after an eight hour surgery. Despite the long surgery and cardiopulmonary bypass time, the patient did well postoperatively and echo on postoperative day two showed normal biventricular function and no residual regurgitation through the valve. So thank you very much for your attention. We'll pass it on to Raphael for the next two cases. Thanks, Marcos. Excellent presentation. I think Fabio is already has already joined. There he is. You want to yeah. go ahead and, and do your cases, Fabio? Sure. Hi, guys. Sorry, I was a little bit late. Yes, let me just let me just share my screen. You guys can see my slide. Yes. Yeah, okay. So hi everyone. Thank you for being here again. 
um, our second year doing the echo rounds together. So, yeah. So just carry on with this session of imaging misinterpretation. So I have no disclosures re um, related to this topic. And uh, my object objectives, actually, I borrowed some of those from Marcus, is basically critical, like do the analysis of the case in which the TE was used to refine diagnosis, detect new pathology, and adjust the surgical plan and assess surgical results. Also do the interpretation of GE findings in the context of surgical literature. And main, mostly important, the, the purpose is for learning and improvement through blame-free discussions around improving patient safety and quality of care. So my first case is gonna be around like, uh, the main topic is gonna be around refined diagnosis. So our first patient is a 54 years old male, has a past medical history of moderate to severe MR, atrial fibrillation, COPG, reflux, and anxiety. So his pre-op TE shows normal LV size, normal LV function, the same for the RV, severe pulmonary hypertension, RVSP of around 80, also a severe mitral regurgitation, mitral regurgitation secondary, secondary just severely prolapsed and flail P2 segment. The aortic valve seems to be normal, and the pre-op plan is mitral valve repair slash replacement and plus or minus tracheostomy drink. This is our first image on TE that we did on that, on that morning, the long axis view. You guys can see the mitral valve is, is disease. The posterior segment, actually the P2 segment of the mitral valve is prolapsed slash flail. Here we have the same picture pretty much with color. And although it's pretty clear the patient has severe mitral regurgitation based on the 2G and on the color flow, we actually did the quantification when, which we got that for a PISA radio more than one centimeter, also the regurgitant volume more than 60 cc's per beat, and also an ROA of more than 0.4 square centimeters, which put this patient on the severe mitral regurgitation um, um, classification. Also, this patient had a, like a um, systolic reversal, reversal on the pulmonary vein flow. And although the jet was eccentric, we were able to align pretty well and it got a pretty good, uh, pretty, good pretty high velocity jet with a good, pretty good envelope. This is the unfossed view 3G. We can see the, the mitral valve defect is a pretty much isolated P2 segment. We can see the P2 is kind of prolapse and flail. And also between the P2 and P3 segment, we can see that there is a cleft in there that was not diagnosed on the chi prior to the surgery. And then comes the first, the first question. Um, the mitral valve prolapse can be associated with what type of uh, congenital heart disease? Osteoprimum ASG, osteosecundum ASG, sinus venosus ASG, perimembranous VSG, or none of those. Um, um, uh, congenital heart disease. Raphael, please. Let me give you 15 seconds. Which one is more associated with mitral valve prolapse, if any? Raphael, I think you're okay now. Yeah, so we have pretty much split between osteoprimum and osteosecundum ASG, and also 18% of perimembranous VSG. So the most common, uh, the most common heart, uh, congenital heart disease associated with mitral valve prolapse is the osteosecundum ASG. It's associated with mitral valve prolapse and mitral regurgitation. It accounts for 70% of all atrial communications. And why I'm doing this question? Because this patient also had like a, a small ASG. As you can see on this um, four chamber view with the focus on the right side and with the focus on the interatrial septum. Here, the ASG is confirmed on the 3G where you can see the jet coming from the left to the right atrium, okay? We carry on, we carried on with the examination. We finished our TE examin examination and eventually got the normal EF, as you can see on the left, on the, on the four chamber on the four chamber view. Sorry, on the bike home and, and the, on the on long axis view, and also a normal RV 
although the right atrium was a little bit enlarged. Carrying on with the examination, we went to the deep transgastric view. And when you did the continuous wave Doppler on the aortic valve, we got this pretty like high velocity dense envelope. And measuring the velocity and also the gradient across this valve, we got a, like a velocity of 3.8, almost four uh, meters uh, per second. And it got a mean gradient of almost 30 millimeters of mercury, with according to the um, ASC guidelines, put this patient also on the moderate uh, aortic stenosis range. So, but the funny thing is um, when it when this patient had the GE done a few few weeks before, the the aortic valve was pretty much normal. So what we did um, before telling the surgeon, before doing anything, so we just went back to the aortic valve. We looked the aortic valve from the short axis view, also on the long axis view, and you could tell the aortic valve was opening and closing pretty well. So what was the cause of this high velocity jet and this mean this high mean gradient? That comes with the pool number two. Based on the TE findings, what's the cause of the gradient across the arch valve? Patient actually has moderate AS, LVO2 obstruction, patient is hyperdynamic, or there is a mitral regurgitant jet interrogation. Rafael, let me stop. Okay, so 82% says it is the mitral, mitral regurgitant jet that we are interrogating, which is true. It's really important every time you, we are interrogating the, either, either the LVOT or the arch valve in patients with a, uh, especially anterior directed severe MR, that we make sure that we are measuring the LVOT or the arch valve flow. It's not, it's not unusual that when you're using the post-wave Doppler or the continuous wave Doppler, especially instead of measuring the um, flow across the LVOT or the aortic valve, we end up measuring, there's some contamination and we end up measuring the mitral regurgitant jet. So instead of getting like a low velocity jet, a, um, a nice and uh, low velocity jet that is, um, that is related to the normal aortic valve, we end up getting this high velocity dense um, envelope that is, was not related to the aortic valve, instead was related to the mitral regurgitant jet. So on this view on the left, we have the envelope uh, related to the aortic valve. You can see the low velocity jet around 1, 1.2. Um, meters per second. And on the right, you can see the jet that is coming from the aort from the mitral regurgitant jet, which is, a, which is a high velocity jet around four um, meters per second and also a pretty dense envelope. Okay, and that comes our question number two, the answer. We are interrogating the mitral regurgitant jet. And then comes our question number three. What are the common echocardiographic features of anteriorly directed MR jet and AS aortic stenosis jet that make them easily to be mistaken? High velocity jets, they are negative, they peak in mid systole, they lie, they lie in the same path of interrogation, or all, all the above. What are the characteristics that make the MR jet and the in patients with aortic stenosis, AS jet that make them easily mistaken. Rafael? Yeah, so the vast majority said all the above, which is true. So the, all the above. Question number four, let's say the patient has aortic stenosis on top of the mitral regurgitant, mitral regurgitation, how can you differentiate the mitral regurgitant jet from the aortic stenosis jet? The onset of mitral regurgitation is during isovolemic systole. The onset of um, aortic stenosis jet is in the mid-later portion of the QRS. The AV morphology to assess the leaflet mobility, B and C, or all the above. Which one are correct? How can you differentiate the, uh, the mitral regurgitant jet from the aortic stenosis jet? Rafael? Okay, there is a split between G and E. 63% um, says all the above, which is the right answer, and why? So 
the mitral regurgitant jet because the pressure grade the, the pressure for the LV to overcome and and uh, cause the regurgitant jet into the left atrium is way lower than the pressure that the LV needs to generate in order to open the aortic valve and uh, equalize with the with the ascending aorta. So the mitral regurgitant jet needs a low pressure. So the mitral regurgitant jet always start earlier in the QRS than the aortic, than the aortic stenosis jet. As you can see on this view, we have like a, the mitral regurgitant jet and you compare with the ECG and compare this one with the aortic valve. You can see the aortic valve because the pressure that the ventricle needs to generate in order to eject the blood flow across the aortic valve is much higher. So it starts and peak a little bit later in the QRS. Here we can compare both. On top, you can see the mitral regurgitant jet. It starts a little bit earlier during the isovolemic systole because the pressure between the left atrium the left and the left atrium is way lower compared with the AS jet, which starts a little bit later in systole. So probably together with the 2G assessment of, with the aortic valve is the easiest way to differentiate the mitral regurgitant jet from the aortic stenosis jet. So this is the true um, um, aortic valve jet on this patient. We can see the mean grade instead of being 28 or 30, something like that, is way normal is 1.2 millimeters of mercury, which is pretty not much normal for a normal aortic valve. This patient end up getting a, the ASG closure and also end up getting a mitral valve repair with an anuloplast ring. Patient came off bypass and did well in the ICU. So case number two, the goal of this one is, to, is how we can use uh, GE to detect new pathology. So case number two, patient 55 years old, female, uh, past medical history, she has a bicuspid aortic valve with a severe aortic stenosis, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, also ulcerative colitis, OSA, and uh, elevated BMI, and also asthma. She, she presented to another service, to another hospital with three weeks history of low-grade fever and an intentional 17 pounds weight loss over the last two weeks. So the first diagnosis was pretty much like uh, related to a flare from the colitis, but then the cultures came back positive. So she had an initial TE, which showed no evidence of vegetation or infective endocarditis. A week later, she was deteriorating. and she had another TE that showed um, vegetation on the aortic valve and also on the mitral valve. Question mark regarding a mitral uh, mitro valve lift perforation and also question mark for the aortic root abscess. Because of this vegetation, um, she had an embolus that was thrown into the LAG and she had a known CMI with, um, in the anterior LV wall. On the 19th, uh, uh, 10 days after she presented to the hospital for the first time, she had transferred to some mics. She had another TE when they saw a, um, when they saw a large independent, independent hemobiomass biomass attached, attached to the LVO, LVOT side of the aortic valve. Severe aortic stenosis with a mean gradient of 47, just mild AI and an aortic root abscess. LV was depressed, the EF was around 36%, with a small vegetation around 1.4 uh, centimeters in the mitral valve. And she also had mitral to moderate MR. So another 10 days of antibiotics, she was referred for surgery on the 26th, and the pre-op diagnosis was endocarditis in the mitral and the aortic valve and uh, aortic root abscess. She was in heart failure on that time and also new onset of AFib. The pre-op plan was AVR, plus the Brightman, reconstruction of the aortic root, and plus or minus uh, mitral valve replacement. So this is our first picture. We can see the aortic valve in short and long axis view. We can see the, the aortic valve is pretty much destroyed. You can see this vegetation on the aortic valve and on the right image. We can see a free flu, probably a free flu cavity here that could be like that could be an abscess. With color, we can see there is no AI or maybe just trace AI. And here you can see the four chamber view and the long axis view. We can see the biventricular function is pretty much depressed, as we saw on the previous GE. 
but also we can see on the mitral valve there is something, some sort of vegetation or some, some sort of mess on the, on the anterior mitral valve leaflet. Patient was in heart failure, as you can see on the left. She has some pericardial, pericardial effusion and some um, pleural effusions on the right. Now, looking at the mitral valve, we can see the mitral valve. There is this like vegetation or tumor in the uh, anterior mitral valve leaflet that is flickering, as you can see. And with color, we can see there is an abscess here on the right. You can see there is flow in diastole. There is some MR. And there is also some flow kind of wrap around the left atrium, the left atrium wall. And that comes the first, the first question. What is the MR severity for this patient? Trace, mild, moderate, or severe? Rafael? Yeah. I think it's okay, Rafael. Just for the sake of time. Yeah, so the vast majority of people said severe, 60%, and also 30% said, said moderate. Okay, so I'll, I'll come back to this question. I'm just going to carry on with the, the, ima with the images. Here we, we see the unforced view from the mitral valve. I apologize for the stitching artifacts. Here you can see the mitral valve, and you can see this kind of vegetation on top of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. Here we can see the 3G from the mitral valve. And I put especially this view, which is not a good one, but just so I'm going to slow down here the loop. I'm just going to start and look on this mitral valve here. Let's see if there is any mitral regurgita regurgitation. So there is pretty much none or trace mitral regurgitation. But what we see when the patient is in, when we are insisting is this jet here that is coming from the interatrial septum. Uh, sorry, that is coming from the um, from the from the ascending aorta, most likely a fistula, as you can see here, which is going to be much easier to appreciate on this view here. Here on the right, you can see the long axis view, and you are able to see to appreciate this jet, this fistula coming from the as from the aortic root into the left atrium. The same thing here, as you can see, pointing here, the jet here. Actually, this patient had none, or pretty much none, or just trace mitral regurgitation. What you're seeing on this view was not a mitral regurgitation. On top here, you can see the jet coming from the fistula that is kind of wrapped around the left atrium wall. So if not the attention, we could say this patient had like moderate or severe mitral regurgitation. Eventually, this patient had none. So based on all of that, this patient had a reconstruction of the aortic root. Also, she had um, um, she had a um, aortic valve replacement. They put a um, biological valve. Also, the brightening of the aortic root and patch at the left atrial wall and the closing the fistula. So this patient is surprisingly, although the, uh, surprising, came off bypass okay and did well in the ICU. So in summary, the, these two cases exemplify situations in, one, in which one error of interpretation could have led to undesired surgical results. And not only a high index of suspicion, but also the correlation of finds, findings with the patient history and acquisition of multiple views in different modalities is essential for accurate information while performing the CHE. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you, Vincent. I'm just going to stop sharing. Mm. And, um, yeah. Okay. I just okay. stopped. Hope you guys can see my screen and hear me okay. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. Uh, thanks, Fabio. Thanks, Marcos. My name is Rafael Zamper, cardiac anesthesia director at Western uh, University in London, Ontario. Uh, no conflicts to disclose for this session. Just wanted to uh, acknowledge on a side note, the, uh, I'm very grateful for all the, the time and effort that both Marcos and Fabio have been uh, investing in this project. I'm very happy to be here. And we promise this uh, second year will be a lot uh, more interesting than the previous one, which was already awesome. 
Uh, my objectives here are to present two cases, uh, same uh, objectives from, my pre from the previous speakers. I also use some recommendations from relevant guidelines of ES ESC uh, applicable to both cases. So moving to my first case, uh, it's a 73 years old patient with uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, sleep apnea on CPAP that presented to his family physician's uh, office with chest pain on exertion, eventually had a stress test that came back positive and was referred to an angiogram that showed triple vessel coronary artery disease and was scheduled to a cabbage times three with all grafts, uh, arterial grafts coming from bilateral internal mammary arteries and from the left uh, radial artery. And as many of our patients that come from uh, uh, for a cabbage, this one did not have uh, pre-op TE, just the angiogram, TT, sorry, just the angiogram showing a normal LV function with uh, no AS and no MR, because uh, that's what they can uh, conclude from the injection of dye into the left ventricle. And so we, I start the case with the fellow. Um, we perform the TE together uh, and we confirm uh, normal biventricular, uh, normal left ventricular function, as you can see. And this is a mid exophageal four chambers uh, dedicated to the RV, where we assess RV function. And uh, just want to remind you from the uh, 2015 guidelines on uh, the recommendations for chamber quantification, specifically for the RV function, the recommendations are to use at least one or a combination of the following recommended parameters. And they elect six uh, uh, different methods. But when we look uh, to each one of those, we will clearly understand that the TAPSI and fractional area change are the, the, the fastest ones. And once uh, for, for example, for tissue Doppler S prime, you need a good alignment, which is very difficult with uh, a TE uh, strain and 3D ejection fraction. They are time consuming. They need a special software, uh, MPI. Uh, also, either you need a good alignment for the tissue Doppler or you will be time consuming doing the trans tricuspid and uh, trans pulmonic valve flows. So usually we do TAPSI and fraction area change to assess once they are uh, easier and faster. And that's what we did in this case. So to the left of the screen, you see the loop and below the loop, you see how you calculate fractional area change. To the top right, you see the end diastolic frame with the right ventricular end diastolic uh, area of 21 centimeters square. And to the uh, bottom right, you see the end systolic loop uh, frame with uh, uh, right ventricular end systolic area of 13.7, which gives us a fractional area change of uh, 35. And when we use the same view to calculate the distance between the lateral tricuspid valve annulus and the apex in both end diastole and end systole, we can calculate a TAPSI of 18 millimeters. And that brings me to my first pool to the audience, uh, which is uh, given the echo findings uh, presented, a fractional area change of 35 and a TAPS of 18, how would you describe the RV size and systolic function? And there you go. Okay, so here are the results and uh, there's a mixed bag uh, with a trend to normal size and normal systolic function and normal size borderline systolic function. Um, so let's review a few things here. First, in terms of size, um, from the image to the uh, top right, you can clearly see that the apex of the heart is formed by the LV. And that by definition excludes moderate and severe RV dilatation. 
Uh, now we have to decide if it's a normal size or uh, a mild dilatation. So you can see to the uh, bottom left how we can measure the right ventricle in, in diastole. And to the top uh, left, you see the cutoffs. So as we measure TAPSI, the end diastolic distance between the tricuspid valve annulus and the apex as being 81 millimeters, uh, the distance highlighted in yellow, which is basically the length of the RV, would definitely be less than 81. And this would make our RV normal size. Um, and when it goes to function, here are the cutoffs. So we have an abnormal or borderline uh, fractional area change in a normal topsy. However, when you go to the guidelines, the, this guideline on RV uh, or right heart in, uh, evaluation in adults from 2010 shows that uh, from all criteria that you can use to assess echocardiographically, uh, echocardiographically uh, the uh, RV, the fractional area change is the one that correlates better with the gold standard for right ventricle ejection fraction, that's the MRI. So I would kind of trust more the fractional area change than the TAPS. Uh, and that's why I would say that this patient has borderline systolic function. So we just came up to the conclusion that this patient has a normal RV size with a borderline systolic uh, function. And this mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, these are other images from the same patient, just showing the tricuspid valve with minimal to trace uh, tricuspid uh, regurgitation and a very faint uh, TR jet. Uh, some people might even consider mild TR, which would not be wrong. And when you see a CVP of 12 with a peak gradient of 16, you come to the conclusion that the RVSP is 25 to 30, and this patient doesn't have uh, pulmonary hypertension. So. I leave for a break, and a few minutes later, the fellow calls me back to the OR. And at that point, they are still harvesting the right IMA. The, uh, there is no major bleeding. And the fellow tells me that this patient has been progressively deteriorating and uh, hypotensive. So now I see a patient in shock. Uh, pressure, uh, blood pressure is 70 over 35. And also patient tachycardic with a heart rate of 120. CVP is high in the 2530s. And the fellow tells me that the RV failed and is now refractory to any volume uh, or pharmacological interventions. So, okay, so let's see the images. And this is what I can see in the same four chambers uh, view that I presented before. Uh, the RV is clearly struggling. At that time, there are inotropes by the vasopressors. Everything is in high doses. And I can also see a significant TR jet that was not present there before. And when I interrogate the jet, now it's a different scenario. I can clearly see that with a CVP of 28 plus a peak gradient of 37, now the RBSP is 65, 70. So something is not correct with this patient. And that brings me to my second pool, which I will put it up for you right now. What is the cause of the RV dysfunction in your opinion? Is it acute pulmonary hypertension crisis? Is it a massive PE? Is it RCA ischemia with RV failure? Is it an extrinsic compression of the uh, uh, RV? I went and shared the results. So it's kind of uh, splitted in between RCA ischemia and extrinsic compression. Um, stop sharing. And moving on. Okay, so I want you to pay attention to this area pointed by the red arrow, which uh, it seems to me uh, something extrinsic to the heart, compressing the heart. And Again, with a steel frame here, you can see this kind of a bulging area with a dark uh, shadow underneath. And uh, that's when I think about what they're doing with the surgery, what's the surgical phase. And we don't do uh, bilateral ITAs very often. So when we do ITAs, we usually do left ITAs. 
And so the retractor in the chest bone, in the sternum, pushes the right side of the chest down, which compresses the right lung. But when they are harvesting the right IMA, they just flip the retractor uh, to the other side of the chest. And now they are compressing the left chest, left border of their sternum down, and that's very close to the RP. So that's what was happening with this case. So it was not an RV failure because of uh, uh, acute pulmonary hypertension crisis or ischemia. It was simply the retractor compressing the right ventricle. And kindly, we request that the surgeons release the retractor. And this is the image we see right away, uh, which now has a sort of a little bit more dilated because there is more volume uh, given to the patient, but function-wise, I would say that it's back to the baseline. It's probably normal now if we repeat the measurements. So this is a cause of the uh, hemodynamic collapse, the extrinsic RV uh, compression by the retractor. And this is the RVSP now uh, with uh, an, an RVSP of 25 after the release of the retractor. Moving to the second case, um, it's again a very similar patient, but now 81 years old, hypertension, dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes, family physician, positive stress test, again, angiogram, found to have triple vessel coronary artery disease, scheduled for cabbage times three, now with the left IMA and two venous grafts, no pre-op TT, but an angiogram showing normal LVEF, no AS, and no MR. So this is a senior fellow working with me now. I'm just observing, lines are in, patient stable. I leave the OR to see other things and to uh, let the fellow work independently. And he calls me back right away saying, hey, you know what? I think I found something in the aortic valve here. Uh, we might need to replace the valve. I'm interrogating the aortic valve on a deep transgastric, uh, uh, not a deep transgastric, but a transgastric long axis view, as you can see at the top of your screen here. And I see this AI jet. It's a very dense jet, so it's compatible with severe AI. And also when I calculate the pressure half time, I find it's 65 milliseconds, right? So based on the previous image, what would be the severity of your AI? And this is the pool that I'm launching right now. Severe, moderate, mild, or no AI. So stop it now, share the results. It's kind of a split between severe and no AI, which is very odd. It's either, we usually say mild, moderate, moderate, severe, but now it's either severe or no AI. So based on the guidelines, just taking into consideration the pressure half time, which is a qualitative method, uh, we would see severe AI, right? We would say severe AI, but is there, Severe AI, well, let's review this. Uh, I started reviewing the images and I see a patient, as you can see, with a normal left ventricular function, apparently normal RV function based on the four chambers as well. And I see a 3D of the aortic valve, which uh, attracts my attention because uh, it's pretty solid that the uh, cusps are coming together and I can even see a Mercedes sign with the, uh, the 3D of this aortic valve. And then when I see these views of the long axis zoomed in the aortic valve, I don't see any AI. I said, well, uh, I was just rushing to see if the surgeons, because, you know, it's a cabbage, it's different surgery. If you have to replace the valve, they have to think about the uh, cannulation and cardioplegia. So we have to answer this question very quickly. And quickly, after just reviewing this, image, I said, hey, just carry on. There's nothing wrong with the aortic valve because it's clearly... Uh, co-opting nicely, and I don't see any AI jazz. So I take a look at the uh, transgastric long axis view, and again, there's no AI, 
But when I see um, the continuous wave Doppler, this is what the fellow was uh, considering AI. And then immediately I see a very low velocity and I know what's going on. So when I pause this loop to your left, to the left of your screen and go frame by frame, I was seeing the early diastolic phase. I see this red jet here, which is the cause of this first spike here. But because the alignment with the Doppler is not suboptimal, we cannot see very well this wave here, right? Only if you examine more detail. So this is the A wave and this is the E wave of the transmitral inflow, okay? Uh, just want to bring, so the person in the OR was interrogating the mitral valve, the transmitral inflow, and looking at the E wave, as a possible AI jet, which is very interesting because Fabio just presented a case, which is the other way around. It's a patient with MR that was thought to be to have AS. So see how in close relation these two valves are and when some pathological jets can be confounded. So this is kind of the uh, recommendation to assess AR severity based on the guidelines proposed for native valve regurgitation in 2017. And you can see that they take into consideration structural parameters, qualitative, semi-quantitative, and quantitative parameters. But when you refer to the ASE recommendations, uh, they are very clear to recommend that you do multiple methods. And when you have conflicting data, then you go to a more quantitative uh, approach to decide in which category of uh, aortic regurgitation your patient will be. Right. Uh, so this is an example of uh, AI pressure half time in a patient with real aortic regurgitation that you can see in a bicuspid aortic valve with a central jet that is not very wide, but uh, I would say clearly mild AI in my opinion. And this is an envelope of an AI jet showing a pressure half time of 400 that it that fits into the uh, mild to moderate, maybe moderate uh, grade. But look at the velocity, very different than the previous one, because this represents the gradient between the diastolic pressure in the aorta and the diastolic pressure in the left ventricle. And that gap is usually 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury, which can only be appreciated with velocities around three to four meters per second and not one meter per second as I showed. So this is my last question and I'm just about to finish. A very interesting question that I created. So based on the image below, I want to know what is the coronary artery perfusion pressure, the CPP. I'll pull the pull, put the pull up. And you'll be able to see the possibilities. Give it just a few more seconds. And I'll share the result. The results. Uh, my artist thinks that it's impossible to calculate without knowing the diastolic blood pressure in the aortic root. Some people think that it's variable. Others uh, say it's uh, 64. So stop sharing. And. Uh, this is how CPP or coronary perfusion pressure is calculated. It's, uh, the diastolic blood pressure in the aortic, in the semi-aortic or the aortic root minus the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. To the left of your screen, you see a normal heart where this gradient, the diastolic blood pressure and the left ventricular diastolic pressure, it's kind of constant throughout the whole diastole. And to the right of your screen, you see what happens with patients in severe aortic insufficiency. The gradient is there just for a brief period of time because the pressures, they equalize quickly. This gap here 
could be, of course, this is pressure, but pressure can be converted into velocities and vice versa using Bernoulli's equation. Uh, so this is a pressure gradient here uh, that can be easily calculated if you know the velocities. And this is what it would be like in a patient with mild AI, just the case I presented right now. So the gradient would be maximum in the early diastole and it would slowly decrease along the diastolic period to the end of the diastole here. So when you see what happens with our patient, you see that this shape is pretty much the same shape of this AI, AI uh, chat. And so here is a uh, pressure, here is velocity. We just calculate the pressures in both uh, yellow and green boxes here. And turns out to be around three and four meters per second which correspond to 36 and 64. And so the answer to the poll is that the CPP in this case is variable between 36 and 64 millimeters mercury. And that's the end of my presentation. And again, thank you very much for joining today. I don't see any questions in our, on our chat so far. If anyone wants to just jump in and ask questions, please feel free. Rafael? Yes. Hi. Hello. This is Hideo. How's it going? Hey, hi there. Good. How are you? Good, good. Uh, so I have two questions regarding the last presentations. <clears throat> yes. So the first, I'm going to start with the one that's the late, the last case. So uh, concerning the um, bicuspid aortic valve, I had a, a case, I think it was Sunday, yesterday, mm -hmm. during the weekend. So it was pretty much by myself for the decision making. And same story, the patient came for a cabbage, didn't have a TTE, had only the angiogram. Then we did the TTE and we saw a bicuspid aortic valve with mild uh, AS and mild mm -hmm. to moderate AI. Actually, it was most of the criteria would put her in the uh, mild category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just one, maybe the venal contractor looking a little bit further could be four, but it was closest to three, so probably mild. Mm -hmm. thing that I'm asking is, um, for, for if it was a tricuspid aortic valve, I would, pre, I would be pretty sure that this patient did not have to have the uh, valve uh, replaced. Mm -hmm. But my question is, if you see a bicuspid aortic valve uh, and you see there's some calcification, even mm -hmm. though the criteria for, for grading the valve is mild or maybe mild to moderate, uh, does this change anything in terms of decision making regarding changing the valve or not? Would How old is your I patient? See? Uh, he actually, uh, there was a, there was a catch. He was pretty young, like six years old, but he had a terminal, uh, cancer, prostate mm -hmm. cancer stage four. So all the, that also, I think played a role in the decision. But mm -hmm. my question is if the valve is by cuspid, should I change anything in terms of the decision-making because only for pressure criteria and velocity criteria, I would no, not I, have dealt at all. Yeah. No, I would not have I, dealt. Yeah. Fabian and Marcus can jump in to help us answer this question too, but I believe that the answer is no, it doesn't change anything. Uh, the only one thing uh, in the caveat I would put on that question is that uh, usually patients with bicuspid aortic valve, they present with uh, aortic stenosis and aortic insufficiency earlier in life. So if you see a moderate AI bicuspid aortic valve and the patient is 62, 63 years old, maybe you should address the aortic valve, which mm -hmm. you would not if the patient, let's say it's a 75 years old coming for a cabbage with a tricuspid with the aortic valve. Uh, the mm -hmm. only one thing that I know it's pretty uh, uh, clear cut off for patients with bicuspid with the aortic valve is uh, when you're replacing the valve, you take a look at the SNE aorta. If the SNE aorta is more than 45 millimeters, you should, uh, uh, replace the ascending two, which is different criteria from tricuspid aortic valves too. I don't know if uh -huh. Fabio and, uh, and uh, uh, Marcos have different opinions. I agree with what you're saying, Rafael. I think, you know, it, given the, just the natural history of bicuspid aortic valve disease, you would not necessarily be able to predict that this AI is going to worsen over time. And if, especially what you're saying with the patient's uh, prognosis and other mm -hmm. medical comorbidities, I would think just do the cabbage in and get out. Excellent. Good. Great. Yeah, yeah, I agree. 
and also if the patient for example if it, like in the next few years like uh, even with this history of cancer he deteriorates and he needs like something on the aortic valve we they always have like the option of uh, TAVI nowadays so sure. I, I wouldn't do anything mm -hmm. good well you have good. a second question right uh, the second question is about RV function. So uh, do you routinely use the RV strain for RV functional measurement prior to you know, every surgery? And if you do, which one, global strain or RV free wall strain, is there any difference between them? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. I personally don't use uh, RV strain. I do from time to time just to for uh, educational purposes with the uh, fellows and trainees. Um, that's my opinion about the RV. I, I think that the septal wall, it's basically LV. So I don't take it into consideration when I do strain in the RV. I, I, and I think that there are some recent papers on that saying that the free wall strain is the most important one when you're addressing the, the RV. And the other thing is if, if you think about global strain, well, the RV wall, uh, if you take the lateral and then the anterior and then the infundibulum, there are different walls, right? So I think it's more important the the, the basal uh, RV wall than the others. And that's usually when you find the highest strain or the lowest, the minus 35, minus 40. So I think that RV strain is still an uncharted chapter of ECHO. Uh, I'd like to see more evidence to use it and guide my decision-making. Uh, but uh, just to answer your question, no, I don't do routinely RV strain uh only for educational purposes mm. okay thanks i don't know if uh, fab and marcos have different experiences yeah our software here doesn't have the rv string software like uh the dedicated rv string um when we use it we use the lv which is also doable but we don't have and and like you said we don't use very often uh, it's easy to use, but like uh, like you said, it's still like uh, we still have a long way to to know exactly how to inter interpret. So we don't use it. Uh, same situation at TGH. The machines don't have the software. Well, sorry, the anesthesia machines don't have the software. The cardiology machines do, but uh, it's not it's not readily accessible. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, here here in London we have the LV strain in the OR, and uh, we can eventually use the cardiologist software to do RV strain as well.